Um, okay, so good evening, everyone, and again, uh, thanks for coming with such a bad weather. Um, oops. So, um, my name is Ricard. I was born, born and grew up in Barcelona. Uh, I came here a year and a half ago. Um, right now, I'm working as a server engineer at a video game studio called Another Place Productions. Uh, I'm a Symphony tool lover and PHP believer, but I added the sometimes into parentheses because quite lately there's a bit of like movement in the scenes and like sometimes there are discussions in the internals that I don't really agree with and you know, PHP is a bit convoluted these days. I try to contribute to open source, sometimes I give talks and you can follow me on Twitter or contact me at this Gmail address. So a bit of agenda. Um, We'll start with a brief Redis, intro Redis introduction, talk about the different data types, the commands to communicate with Redis. Um, we'll talk about how to get started with Redis, very basic commands from Composer and like bit of code and so that you can start get going. Then we'll um, dive a little bit deeper into the SMC Redis bundle, which is possibly the uh, de facto bundle that you should use with Symfony. Um, I'll talk about some cookbooks from my previous experience in real world applications. And um, there are a bunch of slides at the end about sharding data and the new Redis cluster that, whoops, the new Redis cluster that right now it's um, Redis Candidate 1, I believe. Um, this was a request from Casper, who unfortunately is sick today, so we cannot blame him, but um, you can blame him the next time. So let's get started. Um, First of all, what's Redis? So the word comes from an acronym about Remote Dictionary Server. It was created by this Italian guy. I really suggest you follow him on Twitter because he always uh, posts very interesting stuff about Redis, but also about distributed systems and all sorts of things about computer science. It's an open source project, and you can have a look into it. It's written in C, but it's not one of those C code with lots of macros. It's quite readable. So even if you don't have much experience with, P with C, you can get a grasp of what's going on. Um, the best definition for Redis could be, it's a bit long, um, an advanced in-memory key value data structure server. So most people think that Redis is just a key value storage, but under these values, you can have very interesting data structures. And this is why this definition comes from. And it's part of the NoSQL movement and part of the important thing with those systems is that we don't think in terms of SQL anymore, we think back to structures, which is what we should do when we're building applications and when we are thinking about how to store our data and access it. So to me Redis is like a Swiss Army knife. I mean, it's very easy to plug it into your application from your, the smallest application to high traffic websites or even video game companies like the ones I was working back in Spain. Um, very easy to plug. Uh, it can help you lots. Uh, it can help you solve lots of problems in your application. And yeah, I mean, maybe it's the best picture for describing it. So one of the th first things I want to talk about is that Redis is believed to be only memory, and that's kind of true. Your dataset needs to fit in your memory, but it's also persistent, and you configure it in in different ways. So you can have. RDB snapshots, and you can configure how often you want these snapshots. So basically, there's a um, safe section in the configuration where you can say, okay, if 10,000 keys change during one minute, do a snapshot. But if we don't have that much traffic and we have, let's say, 30 keys in the last five minutes, save, it, save them no matter what, so that we don't lose anything. And if we don't like this approach and we need to save more often, it also has the append-only file persistence logs which is similar to um, the MySQL transaction, transaction log, more or less. The bad thing with the second um, storage system is that it can grow a lot. If you think about Redis, you usually do sets and deletes, and the data stays in the database not for so long. But then to work around this problem, the append-only files get rewritten every once in a while so that they don't grow infinitely for just storing a small data set at the end. So if you have experience with memcache, you can think about, okay, Redis could be a main catch on steroids with more structures and also with persistence. You want to read more, you can just go to this website. And even if the fact that it's in memory may sound scary, you need to think that in the new system, we need real-time applications, we need to respond fast. And the only way is that we need to think about the memory as the new disk, and disk is the slow access. It's like the new tape, and the tapes are like not used anymore, possibly, or like only for very old data. 
So apart from that, it has some other interesting features. It has master slave replication, so even if your master goes down, you can still have your data replicated, bring up the slave again, and your application keeps serving, and you have not lost anything because of the persistence and also because of the replication. Pipelining, so if you are trying to send, like let's say, 100 commands to Redis, um, every time you send a command, you open a connection, you send the data, and this is very slow. You can just pipeline them, open the connection, and send the 100 commands at once. And this improves performance uh, quite a lot. Um, you, it also has transactions, but the difference between the pipelining and transactions is that when you pipeline the commands, they are executed um, not in a single thread, but other things can affect that. However, when you send Redis commands inside a transaction, everything gets executed in the same thread, and nothing from the outside can affect that. So this is why it's not really a transaction in the sense of a SQL database, but it has the same sense of like atomicity in the operations. Um, starting with Redis 2.6, which has been in the market for a while, um, you have also scripting with Lua. Lua is a very weird and interesting language. It's not meant to build big applications, but sometimes you need... Uh, there was an accident with it. <laughs> so Lua, Lua is a language that maybe it's not built... It's not meant to build big applications on top of Redis, but sometimes you need three or four operations to be executed just at once. And this is the way you can achieve that. You can um, make the... Redis commands dictionary a, li a little bit bigger with them, and that's fine. Uh, some people can get scared if you have ever worked with stored procedures, but don't abuse them and you should be fine. And a very interesting feature that, feature that came with Redis 2.8 is the iterators for key spaces. So before that, um, if your Redis dataset was pretty big and you had millions of keys, there was no way to inspect those keys unless you did keys star, which is a very um, intense command for the database. And with iterators, you can just say, okay, give me 10, then 10 more, and you are not affecting the database. So this is pretty useful for um, really big data sets. And it also works for um, data inside sets and hashes, and we'll talk about these structures in a, in a while. So let's talk about commands. So the first thing you need to think um, when you are using not only Redis, but any NoSQL database is that you don't have queries. We're all used to this SQL dialects, we send selects, deletes, updates, but with the NoSQL systems, um, you need to work in a different way. Right now, some NoSQL systems are trying to introduce SQL-ish features, like Cassandra introduced SQL, so that we are more familiar with that. But Redis is not going to do that, and you need to learn the commands. So basically, there are no indexes, no schemas, and you just have keys and structures under those keys. Don't be scared though, because it's very well documented. If you go to the Redis website, you'll see a lot of documentation, and there's also a sandbox in the website, so you can test all the commands in there and get a grasp of like what they are about. And another important thing is that all the commands have their um, complexity documented. And if you compare that with MySQL, in MySQL you create indexes, you do queries, and they may work fine for 10,000 records, maybe for 100,000 records, but after millions of records, they start behaving very wrong or sometimes they even crash. And you cannot ensure the performance of a MySQL application um, when it grows. However, with Redis, even though, of course, the commands will be slower as the dataset grows, you will know exactly how they will behave. Oops, sorry. So these are the different data types you have in Redis. Of course, there are strings, binary safe, um, up to 512 megabytes. If you compare that with memcache, then with memcache the limit is one meg, I believe. So you have a lot more to store in there. But the interesting ones are the other structures. So you have lists where they are elements and sorted by insertion order. We'll talk about them with more detail in the next slides. You also have sets of unique elements with um, operations of unions, intersection, and divs. Very useful for comparing sets. You also have hashes, similar to the PHP arrays, sorted sets, which is a structure that only exists in Redis, I believe. And this is very useful for gaming, to introduce rankings and, and leaderboards and things like that. And there's hyperlog log. This was introduced in 2.8.12, so they don't care about the version semantics when they release a new tag. That's, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it's a, they make jokes about that even. And this structure is only useful to compute cardinality of big sets, like think 2 power 64, quite a big number. And if you want to compute how many different items you have in such a structure, you need a lot of memory, but the hyperlog log structure 
makes you able to do that with a small percentage of error, but very memory efficient. And as I said at the beginning, Redis is all about optimizing the memory, so, that, so that's useful for big installations. So you think about strings. Um, the commands you get are basically get, very obvious, set, maybe with an expiration, maybe not. You have str length to check the, the, the length. You can append data at the end. Get range, set range is sort of like substring commands. You can also create bitmap um, strings and then do bit operations. And an interesting type of data are counters because, I mean, if you think again, uh, comparing that to MySQL, if you have counters to store the starts of your website, you need to update the same value over and over again, and this is very, very slow in um, SQL databases. However, with the counters, that's pretty fast. And another important thing to take into account is that if the value you store under the key is a number, um, Redis tries to store it efficiently, not storing the string representation of the number, but the bi binary representation of the number. We had a very bad experience with that. We had a, a set of keys storing numbers. We changed that to numbers, a hyphen, and strings, and we found that the size grow up like five times, and um, we had some severe issues in the video game company, but that's worse story. So lists, I'm sorry about the drawings, I'm terrible. Hope you get the, the idea of that. So the other insertion matters and the sense of that structure is to build queues and stacks. So basically you can push elements and pop elements uh, on the right or on the left if you think about the linear representation. And you even have block inversions of those commands. So the block inversions, what they do, if the queue is, well, the queue, the list is empty, they wait until it times out, until an element comes and then it takes the element or just times out with an, with an nil. Nil is like the, the null value for, for Redis. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's not like a queue system like RabbitMQ or something like that, but if you just want to delegate processes to other systems, it's a, an easy way to, communi to communicate from different systems to another without having to, to set up a, something like RabbitMQ or NSQ or, or any other of the queue systems. So th this may work for some applications. Then you've got sets. Again, this cloud it took me a while to draw it and it's terrible. Um, they are a collection of unique order, unordered elements. So basically, you have the value inserted and if you try to insert them again, um, it doesn't give you an error, but it just returns nil, saying that the element was there, nothing happens, the set stays like that. And the operations you can do with sets are basically uh, counting how many elements you have, adding them, removing them, checking if an, an element is a member of the set, getting the members, and the important thing is that you get intersections, unions, and divs. Um, there's a cookbook that I'll talk about later on, where I can show you things you can do with, with these sets operations. And again, as I mentioned, if the set grows very big, it was complicated to inspect that. You needed to do S members before, but now you can do S scan and get all the elements in a very um, less uh, CPU consuming way. You also have hashes, which is basically having key values inside or under another key. And the operations you get are similar to the, to the ones with key value, but with an H uh, prepended, basically. And again, you can have counters under several keys with H increment, H increment by, H increment by float, and iterators. And you may think, why do we need that if we can maybe um, have a longer key with some sort of like colon or something like that to namespace the keys and values. And the reason why this structure is very handy is that if you have lots of keys, maybe uh, storing them inside a hash is more memory efficient, so it can be handy for, for big installations. If your installation is not that big, maybe it's not very, very useful. And then this is my favorite one, the sorted sets. So they are exactly the same as the sets, but every element in the set has a score. And then you get operations to list um, them ordered, ordered by score. So with Z range, you get um, from the lowest to the highest one. And Z range, it gives you the leaderboard from top to bottom. So the more points go first, and then it goes down. And also, you have the optional parameter with width scores, or just get the elements. It depends on what you need. And again, you have iterators as well. And finally, the, the, the final structure is the hyperlog logs. As I said, it's all about counting unique things. It hasn't been there for a while, so it only has these three commands. And bear in mind that for very big data sets, it has a standard error of 0 0.81, which is not a big deal, but don't expect it to be exactly, exactly precise. But the, the good thing about that is that if you are counting like millions of elements, uh, it does it in a much more efficient way. 
you may think as well, and I, I didn't know what, what it was, like this PF prefix. This is in honor of Philippe Flajolet, a French guy, a computer scientist, contributed a lot in algorithm studies and things like that. So if you go to the Wikipedia, you can know more about him. So let's get started. Before we get started, of course, let's talk about the clients um, or libraries you, we have in PHP to access Redis. Um, there are a bunch of them, but these days the, the two main ones that are maintained are PRedis, which is entirely written in PHP, and PHP Redis, which is a PHP extension. And as you can possibly think, PHP Redis is much faster um, because the big difference is that every time you send a command to Redis, you need to implement a network protocol. And of course, if this is done in PHP, it's much slower than if it's done in C. But uh, PRedis is very mature, it's actively maintained, um, everything is it's feature complete, it comes with every time something is in beta in Redis, they have already added. It's composer friendly. And a very important thing if you have a big installation is that it supports all Redis versions from 2.0 to 2.8 um, or even 3.0 these days, which is the Redis cluster which is still in beta. However, PHP Redis, each PHP um, Redis version only supports a version of Redis, one of the um, so not the, the minor ones are fine, but then if the major ones are not. So depending on, on, on how up-to-date you have your systems, PRedis may, may work better for you until you get up updated. And again, it's true that PHP Redis is much faster, but Redis is so fast that most of the times your biggest concern will be the network latency. So just do some tests and don't do these tests locally, do these tests like with a remote machine and your PHP application so that you can see if introducing the complexity of adding extensions to your system is worth or maybe it's not, at least at the beginning. And again, Redis has clients for almost every language like RabbitMQ and many other databases. You can check them here and, and start playing with any language if you like. So the easy steps, um, especially with Symfony, you require this um, SNC Redis bundle. Current version is 1.1 something, 1.12, 1.3, I don't remember. And then, depending if you are using the extension of PRedis, if you need PRedis, you also need to add PRedis 0.8. PRedis right now is 1.0, supporting lots of new features, but the bundle is not updated yet. So this may change in a couple of months, but for now, it's what it is. So use 0.8, or you can always install the PHP Redis extension, as I mentioned. Once you've done that, um, as many other bundles, you just add the bundle to the register bundles function, and we are mostly done. And the last thing to add is um, some configuration um, to let your Symfony application know where your Redis installation lives. Basically, this would be a, a Redis installation living in the same machine that, that the PHP application is working. So you've got SNC Redis as the um, bundle main um, configuration. Then you've got the clients where you can define one or many. And then you put a key, this key is not important, but it's a good practice to keep the same key here that the alias. The alias is the string that is used by Symfony to create the Symfony services. Here you can say PRedis or PHP Redis, depending on which one of those you, you use. And this is basically Redis, um, semicolon, slash, slash, and then your, your network, network address. And once this is done, you can now use Redis as a Symfony 2 service. So if you are in your controller, um, and your controller needs to extend the Symfony controller and this is maybe a good practice or a bad practice and don't, don't talk about that today. <laughs> um, yeah. You can do this get SNC Redis um, dot and then after the dot this is the alias you, you have put in your configuration and once you have that object you can basically use uh, any Redis command here and um, a different, uh, so a, a list of arguments. So for instance, set is basically, this, that's the key, that's the value. But other commands need, um, you know, more, more, um, more uh, parameters to it. So for instance, to get the top 20 of your leaderboard, this could be the key, starting with position zero, getting 20, and also give me back the scores. This is the, how you should, you could call that. This is another example using set but with expiration and also doing, uh, doing it exclusively. So what it does is like, if this key does not exist, it will create it and it will expire an, after an hour. This is expiration 3,600. 3, and this NX, what it does is, um, if the key does not exist, it creates it. If the key exists, it returns you nil and the expiration that was there is the one that stays. 
So depending on what you do, of course, um, you have different operations. Of course, if you want to keep things decoupled, dependency injection, blah, 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 let's not talk about that either. But it's fairly simple. So the same way you had this get, you can have an argument type service with this ID injected to your awesome service, something similar to that, and you can use it the same way in your services or any, any class you, can, you want. And another important thing to get started is that Redis comes with the Redis CLI um, application, it's a small client. Um, you can experiment with the commands in your uh, local Redis installation and you can type monitor and what monitor does is that it outputs all the, act all the operations that happen in the server. So for instance, when you are launching a new feature to production and you want to see how if everything is like the, all, the all the operations uh, go to the instance as expected, you can do that. Uh, don't leave it running for a while, for a long while in, in production because monitor is heavy, is CPU consuming, but at least to get a, a first sight of what's going on, it's very handy. And um, I really recommend you to, to do that every once in a while so that you can see if your application is, is working as expected. This is for instance, um, Symfony, the Symfony session being stored in Redis, it does a set -ex with some, uh, this is the PHP session ID, the cookie. Um, this is the TTL you define and this is the session object uh, serialized. So once we've done that, um, if you look at the SNC Redis bundle documentation, it's quite long and there are lots of options out of the box, so I think it's worth um, discussing them. Oops. So as we mentioned before, uh, you can have lots of clients if your application is very big. So for instance, this is similar to what we had in the gaming company. We had a Redis instance for the leaderboard. Then we had some queues implemented on top of Redis and these queues were living in a sort of Redis cluster. We'll talk about the cluster thing later because there is no such thing as Redis cluster, but PRedis treats this sort of DSNs like if it was a cluster. So you can, so it abstracts you from, from you know, uh, distributing the, the data into the three instances. You just send the data to, to this um, queue service and then um, the Redis, um, the Redis library um, decides where to go. And then for instance, you could have another um, Redis instance for the session, another one for stats. And here I've, I've used a small feature of Redis that I haven't talked much about. So every Redis instance, um, you can have 12, what they call separate databases. And this is a way to use database zero, which is the default one. Or if you want to have the second database being used, you can do it that way. The downside of that is that every time you use one of the other 12 databases, you need to send an extra operation to Redis, which is select the second or the any number of the database. And it's not a big deal, but um, if you have 20 queries to Redis using four or five of these, you add five queries to these 20 queries, so it can get complicated. So my recommendation is, if your application grows, just split um, the one Redis application into many Redis um, instances for different purposes. But if you just have a small, a small uh, installation and you just want to experiment, just start with one, you can always move the data after, after a while. So um, I showed the PHP session support. Um, adding that to your application is very simple. So you basically create a client like an, an, any normal client. It's useful to call it session, but you could call it anything. And then at the same level of clients, you create a session key. You mention which client you are referring to. Again, you can call it anything as long as it's the same here. You can add a prefix um, to, the, to the keys so that you can inspect them later with keys or something. You add the TTL in seconds. And then I think it was two or three months ago, they added these two extra parameters so that the session gets logged in every request. So let me explain to you a little bit what, what's the problem with that. So you have an application with lots of Ajax requests happening at the same time, trying to update the same records. You can have a situation like that. So this is request one. The session gets started. You read the data from the session. And before this session gets updated, there is a second request getting the same session data. And if you are not preventing this um, HTTP request to read that data, you can have this request updating the data here, but this request updates data after that without having into account these changes, and you can lose some of the updates. So with this, with this addition, 
uh, Symfony is preventing you from, from having this situation. And what will happen if you have two Ajax requests at the same time trying to update the same data, the second one will have to wait until the first one ends. The session gets, um, again, unlocked, and then you can try again. You can have some race conditions with that. So the way it works is like, OK, the request starts. It checks if the session is free or not, and then it has it retries every once in a while. So this is in milliseconds. It's a use lip. So maybe this is a bit too short. It's the default value. So I, su I suggest to at least put that into uh, one million, so one second of waiting time, because otherwise you are retrying lots of times, maybe for no for no reason. But then again, you need to test that in production and, and check your the best value for you. Or if you don't want to have this this feature, you can just say locking false and nothing happens and it works like it worked before. Maybe it's not a good idea, but it has worked like that for a while, so I guess it's not that bad unless you have lots of concurrent Ajax requests for the same user at the same time. So if you are using Doctrine, um, you can use Redis as a cache. Um, gets a bit tricky here because um, the result cache, cache uh, works with setX, so it has expiration, and we can define that in our code for each query, how long do we want to wait. So Sorry, we want to wait. So how long we are keeping the data um, cached, However, with the metadata cache and the query cache, um, it's not, it doesn't have a, a timeout, a TTL, so basically it's your responsibility so that every time you change your doctrine mappings, you delete that data so that it gets stored again. So if you've never um, looked into that, so doctrine has three levels of cache. First one is the metadata cache, so it's basically your, the data you have in the annotations, XML, YAMLs of your entities. Then it has a query cache, so it's basically um, when you are using DQL for Doctrine, what it does is it parses the DQL, it converts it to SQL, and then it stores because you know um, it's not very useful to do it every uh, at every request because the result will always be the same. And the important one is some queries you want to 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 cache them for a while. And as I mentioned, because of the implementation they chose for that, it's possibly better to just use APC for those two and just leave that one with Redis because in every in every query you can specify how long you want you want to wait or you will need to um, make your deployment process a bit more complicated in order to delete delete those those keys and again the process is very similar you define a client here and this client is referred to into these three different keys another one is monolog um, they implemented monolog um, so the, the, the Redis logging with lists using R push. And of course, if you are logging things to Redis, be careful with memory because if you are logging with devil, devil set, so info settings, you will have your your, your log like very very filled very very fast. Here, I've chosen, for instance, a PHP Redis type. Um, again, an alias, and the way it works is like similar to the other ones. A key with monolog. You define the client. You define the key. You can even specify a special formatter that gets defined here under your services definition. So for instance, this could be the log stash format, although it's into Redis, it's a bit silly to do that, but it was just an example, of course. And um, once you've done that, what it does, it creates a service with SNC Redis monologue handler, and we need to add that to our monologue handler so that it's, um, it's taken into account with your monologue settings. Of course, again, at least put warning here because otherwise every request will lock everything here and your Redis instance will be completely filled with, for no reason, with kernel requests, kernel everything. And finally, there's, Swift, there's the Swift Mailer implementation. Um, I don't know if you ever looked into, into the Swift Mailer library, but you can pull the email so that if one request is sending three or four emails, they just get. Um, Get in, so they, they are put into a spool and they are sent all of them at the end of the request or maybe with some CLI process. Very similar again, um, another key called Swift Mailer, the client, the Redis key, and in Swift Mailer you need to define the spool to, so that it uses the SNC Redis spool. Very simple. And if you inspect Redis, you will see that you have the Swift me my messages um, being serialized in a list. So very simple. So. Apart from that, there are other cookbooks from real world applications. I mentioned that before, so in the video game company we use Redis as a queue. And one of the benefits of that is that we can have different languages accessing the data. So we had the PHP application um, putting the data into Redis and we had some Python workers reading that, that data. We use that, for instance, um, to send requests to the Open Graph um, API in Facebook, which is quite slow. 
And obviously, doing that in the HTTP process was um, making a lot of harm in our application, so we took this approach. But again, as I mentioned, if you need some advanced message um, queuing, if you need different um, exchange uh, for your messages so that not only one process accesses the data, but many, you should better look at RabbitMQ or something something similar. Or there are many queue, very good queue options in the market. So, But again, if you just want to delegate some, some works somewhere else, it's just fine. Real-time um, dashboard. So everyone likes real-time dashboards. All your bosses will ask you, okay, we want to see how many people bought today, how many tickets we sold, blah, blah, blah. And then you have this poor MySQL table having select for update and update in every request, and you will see that it's suffering. You just put Redis, you create a hash called stats or anything. You have different keys, like people who bought, amount bought, orders, blah, blah, blah. Very fast, um, it will not affect your application at all. You won't even notice, and your boss will be very happy to see how good or bad, but then it will, it will not be very happy um, the, co the company is doing, is, is doing that day. And for, especially for gaming, or if you have any social component in your application, leaderboards, you try to do that with any other system, it's a pain. With Redis, it's very simple. You just increment the user ID with some value, and then you get the top 20, top 100, whatever you want. And another important thing is that you can very easily store several millions of members under one key. In the video game I worked before, we had some leaderboards with 100 million users, and it was not a big deal. Of course, it was lower than 10,000, but it was not a big deal anyway. So you can safely do that. And an interesting cookbook um, using sets is the typical who is online. So you think about the who is online feature, it's basically how many people are, have been using the application in the last 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever you want. So one way we can achieve that is we use different sets for every minute. And then minute one, you have these users, minute two, you have these users, blah, blah, blah. And then if you do a union of all these minutes, you get the users that have been using your application in your last four minutes. And this is a union. So basically what you would do is union between all these different sets for the last minute, or you could even store them in a new set. So S union store is the same as S union, but you specify where you want to store this union. And then you can basically do S card and know how many users are using your, your application. It's not super ultra fast, but it's much faster uh, than, than doing it with MySQL or any other system. And SCAR is the, um, the cardinality, so the amount of users, and then you can even obtain them to list them with S members and show them who is online, basically. And related to that, one of the favorite social network features, who amongst my friends is connected? So if we create another set of sets with the key being friends hyphen the user ID, and then we do an intersection between people who is online with the people who are my friends, you get who amongst your friends are online. And think about how you would do that with MySQL or any other SQL system. You would suffer a little bit, possibly, and maybe the response time will be timeouts 99% of the time. And with Redis, it's just a couple of operations, and it's pretty, pretty fast. I mean, obviously, these operations are n times m complexity, so it's not the fastest one, but it's much faster than doing it with any other um, database. So, sharding clustering, and this is, you'll see that this is when it gets a bit tricky, this is why the Lannister for here. So, we, I mentioned that it needs to fit in memory, and of course, if your data set grows, there will be a moment where your memory is not enough, and what do we do then? You have some proxy servers, like twin proxy, but um, apparently this was developed by Twitter, but they never used it for Redis in production, so I'm not sure how well it performs. Redis cluster is not ready yet, it's currently RC1, and who will be the brave one who will introduce Redis cluster without a big community support? Not me, possibly not you either. So the best thing we can do these days is client-side partitioning, so our library decides how to hash the data and decide to which of the instances go, and we are lucky that this is supported in many clients and both PRedis and PHP Redis support that. But then again, we need to think about how to share the data. And there are two, two different approaches, the range partitioning and the hash partitioning. I'll talk about that in a minute. And also, there's another technique, which is pre-sharding, and I also discussed that. So another warning here. 
Um, I mentioned that the SNC Redis bundle supports the clustering here, but by default, it's using a random distribution strategy. What it means is that if you are sending data from a user, one time the data will go to the first instance, the second time it may go to the second one, because the distribution is not consistent. It's random. I don't know why they chose this approach, but that's how it is. So the, the way to override that is that under this client thing, you open the options, you say cluster, and you define your own strategy with something like that. This extension, so this class, needs to extend the PRedis cluster um, class, and then in the constructor you need to inject here which strategy you want to choose. And the most common one is the naive module strategy, what, and what this is about is just, okay, you take the key, you hash the key, possibly with CRC16 or some hashing algorithm, the fastest one, and then, depending on how many instances you have, you do modulus that number, and you decide where to go. And you think about that, this will uh, remain um, consistent um, all the time. The problem comes when your topology changes. So for instance, maybe you decide at one point that you have three nodes, and that should be fine for the next six months, but your application is successful, you need to add a fourth node, and then again, your data is not in the place, so you need to do some resharding, and that's painful. And I've done that, and it's painful. <laughs> so always bear in mind that. Um, I, I've used PRedis here because um, this bundle, for, it works with PHP Redis, but it doesn't work uh, with PHP Redis for clusters. So oh. PHP Redis has a Redis array class for client-side sharding, and it also supports um, this resharding thing with a CLI command, but it's not supported yet in the bundle. So if you go for cluster, either you create your own connectors, or if you want to stay with the bundle, you will have to use PRedis, so bear that in mind. I told you it was tricky with that. So, um, I mentioned the range partitioning. So the range partitioning is all about um, using the key, not hash it, and decide what to do. And again, there are two approaches. We could say, okay, users one from 100,000 go here. When our application comes successful, the next 100,000 go here. And then, still successful, create a new instance. And this is good for, oper for operations because it's easy to predict scale, but then the load is not properly distributed, so you could end up with this instance not being used at all because people have are tired of your application, basically, and only the last one is very active, so it's possibly not the best way to do that. Another way of doing that is take the user ID and again take the modulus approach. With that one, the load distributed is okay, it's fairly easy to reshard, but it only works if your keys are something like the user ID, which is um, with big cardinality. Otherwise, you will have, okay, maybe your keys are strings, and 70% of the keys will end up here doing a modulus of the, string, uh, of the number representation of the string, and these ones will be underutilized. This is why um, the hash approach is, is a bit better. So this may work in some cases, but it's not a silver bullet. So possibly the best approach is to do hash partitioning, um, all these guys have a very similar distribution for a diverse number of keys. So my recommendation is always choose CRC 16 or 32, which are pretty fast compared to MD5 or Murmur 3. But then again, depending on, on the nature of your keys, you may see that Murmur 3 or SHA-1 is better to distribute. So we, you will always need to, to keep an eye on that. And again, usually you could use the modulus distribution, but there's another algorithm called Ketama. And what it does, instead of just doing this modulus thing, it creates subsets um, inside here so that mathematically it's proven that when you need to reshard, you don't have to move that many keys, but again, it's a painful experience. So no matter what you do, resharding will become complicated. And there is no solution for that, unfortunately, yet. A different approach, we took that in the game company for some data is to overshard or pre-shard. So basically you have a big instance with and you are faking it, having four different Redis instances inside. And then when they grow, you just move them away, you move the data set away, but you don't need to reshard the keys because they are already in their, own, in their own place. So again, this may work for some cases, but you need to be very careful with memory limits for the different um, Redis um, instances running. And it's possibly not a good idea either in, in many cases. And also it's a bit of, of over-engineering, so my preferred one would be that one. But again, it depends on your, your application. So, Redis cluster. Lots of promises, three years of development, shared data set among endnotes, so one of the things we wanted. Um, it has a responsive failover, so 
the way it works is you have many masters and then many slaves connected, each, each slave connected to each master. So if one master um, dies, then one of the slaves gets promoted and thankfully, or if you are lucky, nothing gets lost. This was partially covered already with a tool called Ready Sentinel that you can plug now in your application and have um, master slave replication and it will inspect if one master goes down and promote the new slave. But um, some people have proven that this is not very resistant to big network partitions, so possibly not the best solution for big clusters. And also, the Redis cluster supports the resharding, so no painful experience anymore. But again, who will be the one who tried it the first time with millions of keys? Good luck with that. So, if you have looked at the NoSQL ecosystem, they, call about, they talk about the CAP theorem, and what the Redis creator says is not CP nor AP. It's eventually consistent sometimes, but it's not very resistant with some network partitions. You, if you look at the documentation, I mean, you will be scared. So I think it, takes, it will take time until, until the community is familiar with Redis cluster and we have big installations with that. Because I've read the documentation, I think it will work more or less great for 10 nodes, but where for hundreds of nodes, Redis is not the solution and you should possibly go with Cassandra or React which are much better for these, for these scenarios. And again, there's been lots of polemics. The PHP community is not the only one who has big arguments, so all the NoSQL databases have them as well. You can have lots of fun every day and not work at all just reading the blog post. And <laughs> so deep, eh? You can get entertained. So some final thoughts. Um, basically, Redis is perfect for applications with intensive read-write. For data that is only stored temporarily, it, it doesn't mean that it needs to be data that we can throw, it, throw away. It can be very important data that the daily starts, like the daily starts, but it's temporary. So it's not suitable for archive data or anything like that. The data needs to fit in memory. If you are predicting that after a month it will not fit in memory, choose something else. And again, don't try to use Redis for something it's not meant to. I mean, if your problem is not fitting any of the data types, just go for something else. I mean, Redis is not a silver bullet, it's not the best database. It solves very well the problems they solve, but if the, your problem is not fitting any of those um, structures, just choose something else. And if you need predictability and you have an application that may eventually scale a lot, this is very handy. And those like me that have suffered the problems with MySQL scaling know what I'm talking about. And again, as I said, it's not suitable for big data sets, relational data, because, you know, MySQL, PostgreSQL, even Oracle, if you have the money, they are absolutely fine to scale. And these days, everyone is using MongoDB. Why would someone use MongoDB when it doesn't scale? But that's another story. <laughs> and, um, you know, the only NoSQL databases that really scale are Cassandra and React. The other ones are a bit, you know, not very well proven to scale. So if you have experts with MySQL and PostgreSQL, don't go for Mongo. Just use them. And if you don't know how you will access the data, you will need something that has some SQL support or something like that. So if you know your data needs to, to be accessed by the data analyst, Redis is not suitable for that because they will do all these weird queries with joins and things like that, and Redis is not for that. And again, you've seen that it gets tricky for distributed application, it gets tricky for big data sets, so always read very well the documentation, do lots of testing, and not just put, throw the cluster then and, and pray for the best because it will possibly smash you in your face. Always choose the right tool for the job. And I wouldn't want to end without thanking my friends at Social Point, Ronnie and Alonso. Alonso is working at Spotify now. Ronnie will possibly come to London soon, hopefully. <laughs> then Antiraid, the creator of Redis, SNC for the Redis bundle, NRK for the PRedis library. Nicolas for the PHP Redis extension and of course to all of you for being here today and if you've got any questions now now is the time and thank you Well, the, the, yeah, yeah. So the basic advantage is that the basic advantage. No, the question was that um, it was about using Elastic Cash in AWS. Um, so, so this is a very recent project um, in terms of AWS. So um, we started using that at Halo, uh, like six months ago. And back in the day, they only had the 2.6 version. But I also used that two months ago, and it already has the 2.8 version. So it's fine for that. 
it's not very very up to date so right now 2.8 is at 2.8.14 or something like that so if you want the cutting edge version you will not get that because Amazon is not updating very often them but you have all the goods for 2.8 and on top of that with Elasticash you pay a little bit more but you get all the monitoring the failovers you have a default master slave configuration with Redis Sentinel so unless you have very good ops I would go for that no question and there is no um, big downside of using that you can um, tune every uh, persistent configuration as well so they have the default ones with the RDB approach but then if you want to go for a only file it allows you to create um, a special I don't remember the exact name in NWS but there's something like special uh, storage configuration something like that where you can specify how often do you want the AOF syncing so yeah I would totally go for that in fact, in the video game company, I will use Elastic Cash, so I know if that gives you any more confidence, but um, yeah. The only downside is that you will never get the last cutting edge version, but you get many other goods out of it, so I'll go for that. Yeah. No more questions? Hey. You've shown uh, like the uh, use case of uh, showing last, like uh, users logging from uh, Last 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. What do you think of other use cases you've used Redis for, or you've seen people use it for? Like, you mean for using sets or any other? Yeah, any other. It's just the good use cases for Redis when you. Okay, so. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, for instance, in the video game company, which is possibly the biggest installation I've been, we had like 40 Redis instances. We had queues that uh, we already discussed that we had obviously leaderboards we had um, some sort of like in, in games one of the very important metrics is the session duration duration which is not exactly like this online thing so we tried to do that with with any other database and we found that the more reliable way was to like have some sort of heartbeat in every command and use sets to achieve that in order to be able to calculate the average session of the players we also use that for um, something called cheat detection. So our game was one of those social games where people start clicking and then you can have bots doing that and people created bots for doing that. So for every command, for every user, we stored in Redis hashes the um, many things and then we had the business analytic guys inspecting that after that. So one of the important things we had, we had millions of daily users so we could not have the application being slow for that. This is why we chose Redis for, for um, trying to in detect this, this cheating. Um, then at another company, we use Redis for all sorts of like caching, uh, different sort of things, and you know counters of activity. Um, for instance, um, um, I was working in a language learning company, so for instance, we wanted to know how many um, units of the language learning the user completed, so we had hashes for every user for the different languages so the the key was the username sorry the user id then the keys inside the hash were the language they were uh, studying and the sort of like unit they were doing and then counters so yeah these kind of things you know if that answers your question yeah so would you say there's still some space for memcache or it's um, forgotten to um no i think memcache there is no benefit of using memcache it's just slightly slightly faster if you do udp and you do IG binary with the extension is like maybe 5% faster. So if you need that 5% and you don't care about the, your data, you may possibly still use memcache. But other than that, I would use Redis for anything to cache. Then Redis, you can have an instance with Redis with the persistence being disabled at all. So it will behave exactly the same way as memcache. The protocol is compatible, so anything will work. So yeah, I would never use memcache again. But that's my... <laughs> That's me. Maybe someone has something to say about that. But, uh, and also with Memcache, you have the problem of there's only one meg of, of storage under, one, under every key. Here you have 500 megs. If you are storing 500 megs under a key, you have a problem. But, well, maybe. Or you are maybe storing, I don't know, the Carta Magna <laughs> extended version, or I don't know what. But yeah, I would not use Memcache anymore. But maybe it's because I know Redis a lot and I know how it behaves. I understand that people who have legacy applications, they have been using memcache for many years. And if you are not going to use any of the goods of Redis, maybe it doesn't make sense at all to change it. But if you are starting a new application, just go for Redis. That's my advice, of course. You can argue with that if you want.
you mentioned about the um, the, the master slave reputation, mm -hmm. um, but so so if you had a cluster of uh, say four um, four Redis uh, mm -hmm. instances uh, and one of them went down, um, how easily is that switched over? And Oh, yeah, okay, so the question is about the master-slave replication and if the master goes down, how the slave gets promoted and all these sort of things. So without Redis cluster, the way it works, um, you need to put Sentinel on top of it, which is another um, another application developed by, by the Redis creator. And what Sentinel does is it starts pinging both the master and the slaves, and whenever there is a delay with the master, it tries to promote the slave, and then the system um, keeps working. You need to change your application, so instead of connecting to the master, you need to connect to Sentinel, and Sentinel proxies you the query to the to obviously the master the master node. And if you look at the internet, you will see a guy called Afir from San Francisco. He tries to destroy all NoSQL databases, and he has a use case with a big network partition where Sentinel works, but it works in a very faulty way, and 40% of the data is lost during that period. So it's a bit tricky. Um, Again, with Elasticash, you have one click failover, but it's not that automatic, so you need to, you need to, to be careful with that. Yeah. So, so, so instead of the four um, uh, or, or the three connection strings that you had before, mm -hmm. it would just be one that goes to Sentinel? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you will need to use um, the Sentinel connector, blah, 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 and, and it's, it's slightly different, but then once, once this is done, it's out of the box. Yeah, yeah. Then you can also, if you have master slave and you have a very intense read write application, you can go back to the, let's go back to the, this definition. So you can add here a question mark master, I believe it is, and then the writes will go to the master and the reads will uh, get divided to the slaves. So this is the way to have this library work master slave, like the way it will work with uh, MySQL, for instance, master slave. But yeah, for failovers, it's a bit, it's a bit tricky. And yeah, if you have Sentinel, you need to query Sentinel and then it will show you the master and that's the thing, yeah. Yeah, I mean, and there are lots of topics that I didn't have time to talk about, but yeah. We can discuss later a little bit, if you want. So, no more questions? Well, I'll stay, I'll stay for a while, at least to finish my beer, possibly hot right now, but... <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you for coming.